Hello and welcome to Low Carb Conversations. I'm your host, Leah Williamson, and I'm with my host, Holly Jean. Welcome, Holly. Hi, Leah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everyone. It's New Year, new episode today. (laughs) We're back from our holiday break, um, myself being at the beach, (laughs) Holly being in the snow. (laughs) Uh, I'm not in the snow, but it is freezing. Yeah, pretty cold where you are. And which I feel like to be this cold and to not have snow, I'm being cheated. Yeah. Because like the snow is like the fun reward for having to tolerate the cold. Exactly. And I don't have that fun reward. <laughs> it's just bitterly cold. <laughs> but on the flip side, I also don't have to dig my car out of any snow either. So I'll take that as the blessing. <laughs> that sounds good. Well, we've got a great year coming up. We're booking in some guests at the moment um, to bring to you. But tonight, today, tonight, today, it is just the two of us. And we've got an article to share that Holly is going to share with us. But before that, Holly, what's your what's been happening for the new year? Anything exciting coming up on the horizon that you want to share with us? Um, yeah, I kind of feel like my new year has started with a bang. Um, I've actually, I have some new nutrition clients starting a program. Um, I think a lot of people, of course, with the new year's and new year's resolutions, that's to be expected. So I have new nutrition clients and then I'm also officially, um, working as a realtor and I had my first clients this past week. So, um, that's been very exciting and fun stuff is happening. I'm, I'm excited for the new year. How about you, Leah? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Same here too. I've, uh, got a new program starting next week, which, um, I've got a few participants in it's called healthy, creating healthy habits for life. And this time we're focusing more on making habits and changing limiting beliefs and turning those into, uh, you know, habits that can last and uh, and not being stuck all the time in that same kind of loop. So it's really great. I'll probably talk a bit more about some of the philosophies from it during the article that we're going to review today, but I'm really excited for the program. It incorporates also more of the holistic lifestyle. So not just um, food, food's the great starting point, but we know there's a lot of other factors that go into that as well. So we go into hydration, we go into sleep, uh, we go into movement, and um, and of course the underlying thing is just how to create those habits that that last. So yeah, I'm really excited for that because it incorporates a lot of my um, ideas and things that I've been working on for the last little while. So it's all coming together. I love that, and I like that there's this shift in kind of like the nutrition and wellness space where it's not just focusing on the new diet or what we're eating. Like people are really wanting to make lasting sustainable changes and incorporate those habits for, for their lifestyle for a lifetime. So I love that you're able to do that. Um, Will you be sharing like links and stuff so our listeners can learn more? This first round, I've got Mm -hmm. a, 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 beta test group going through just to make sure I'm ironing out any problems and then yeah I'll be opening it up to everyone and the other thing too is I'm moving my business pretty much online so I'll be doing um, a lot of my nutrition work online so if anyone's listening and they are from anywhere and they want to connect with me I'll definitely um, have you can connect with me through the website low carb conversations or you can uh, come and find me on Instagram at nourishing conversations and yeah, moving everything online. We've just had um, our borders reopen here in the state that I live in. And we're having about uh, 10,000 plus cases of COVID every day. So we're just uh, moving everything online just to, to be safe. So Nice. Well, you can reach more people that way too. Yeah. So. I feel like I'm like a, about a year behind you guys in the US. <laughs> with- <laughs> It's like, we've already all transitioned online. Welcome to the party. Yeah, that's right. All right. You've got a great article to start the year off, Holly. So how about you share that with us? I do. And I know we've kind of talked about this subject before, um, especially when it, when that Cosmo article came out, I think it was a year or two years. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it might've been two years ago by now. Um, maybe a year ago, it was a year ago. Um, and, and, you know, it's just something that keeps circling around, but this article, it's called three lies, the body positivity movement keeps pushing that are hurting women. And I'm so glad we're discussing this article today because 
I think, I, I think the body positivity movement has a lot of really good things going for it, but it is not without flaws. And I think it's important that we talk about those things. And so um, this article is just bringing light to it. And it kind of just summarizes by saying the body positivity movement's goal is to end the harmful consequences of negative body image. Um, and it's really made great progress through that message um, that your worth doesn't come from your weight. However, the body positivity movement, it undoes this progress kind of when it talks about um, claims that any weight is acceptable and even healthy. And that's kind of circling back to what we talked to in that about that Cosmo article. Um, but by avoiding the issues of obesity in particular, the, the body positivity movement is um, it allows for physical and those mental consequences of those negative health things to continue hurting people. So I want to dive into this article. First off, Leah, did you have any like thoughts right out the gate about this one? No, I just thought it was interesting to read a different perspective on it. Like, you know, I was kind of like, Oh yeah, I can, we did talk about some of these topics in the, the cosmopolitan article, but this, yeah, is this going a little bit deeper into it. So yeah, let's, let's unpack it a little bit further. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's talk about a little bit more of like what this body positivity movement is. Cause, um, I think people have different ideas of what that means. Like when you hear body positivity and, um, so just some of the goals of the movement is to kind of challenge the way society views our body and it, it's promoting the acceptance of all bodies. It's helping people build confidence and acceptance of their own bodies. And it's, um, and it's bringing light and addressing these standards of unrealistic beauty or, um, appearance. And so it's just kind of like, those are the good things about it. Like that was the, I think the intent of what the movement started as. Um, and I think it looks different for different people too. Um, and they've kind of taken different meanings out of it. So depending on who you ask, people can think that it could just be maybe appreciating your body in spite of its flaws or just feeling more confident in your body and about your body. Um, I think we get a lot of the self-love stuff from this movement um, and just accepting your body for whatever shape or size that it's in. Um, and, and those are the good things. Um, the article talks about Specifically, it says the body positivity movement has gotten right, that weight doesn't define a person and that there is no perfect body type. However, they kind of turn a blind eye with other things. This article says specifically that the lies that this movement is telling you, or I would like to reframe it as mostly what it got wrong. I don't know if it's necessarily it's not really saying a lie. lies, but yeah. where it's just kind of it the waters get a little bit muddy and maybe the messages and um, what it's promoting really don't align with health. And that's saying that if the body wants it, it must be good. So it's kind of saying like, whatever your body wants, just do it. Don't deny your body. You know, <laughs> it's kind of like reminds me of the sixties. It's like, free yeah, love. Free love. <laughs> like, you just do whatever you want. My body says this, uh, <laughs> even though my brain says no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, and it also says that if you don't feel like exercising, then you shouldn't have to. And it has this um, message of if any pressure that is put on people to want to ch to change their body is bad. And it even goes as far as like people who are making efforts to want to change their body or to say to lose weight or get healthier even kind of demonizing those people for wanting to change their body. Um, and so I think that's where things go wrong. Hmm. Um, what do you think about those? I, th I feel like, uh, you know, we're looking at an interpretation of the body positivity, posi positivity movement by many different people. And then we're also looking at an interpretation here of somebody's objections towards the movement. And I think like the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And I think people who are into the body positivity movement were pro are probably listening going, no, that's completely wrong. They just have it that, you know, all wrong. And then, you know, and then, 
you know, so, and the flip side as well. So I feel like interpretation, we see this all the time in all different movements, in the keto movement, in the paleo movement, everybody has these different interpretations of how this is for them or how they perceive it or see it. So uh, I feel like when we're talking about this, we're just generalizing again. We can never really know where the actual truth is with that. It's only my opinion on what I've read about the movement or what I've been involved in or what I see these um, people against it. So I think when we start talking about it, like we're going to now, we should probably just take that with a objective view, like we do with everything when we read the, the, the latest news health articles. Would you agree right. to that? I, I do agree to that. Yeah. I mean, we have to take everything with a grain of salt because everybody is going to have their own um, opinion and interpretation of what the messaging is, which is why articles like this are written in the first place. Yeah. And then for, for me, on top of that, some of these, you know, the lies or that they're, they're calling them, um, you know, like I, I can see the point of view that the author is trying to say here. I mean, for me personally, movement exercise is a really big part of my health journey. So there's no way that I could, if my body was on the couch and my brain was saying, we've got to get up and run or, you know, get up and do something. Um, my, and I'm saying, oh no, no, I don't need to do that because the body positivity movement says I am allowed to just lay here if I want to. I don't think that would work for me. Like if you know what the point that I'm trying to make there, it's kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, I need to be, have that motivation inside to get up and keep going every day because yeah, I could very well just lay on the couch and never move again and mo- right. move, but movement is so important to my health and feeling good and releasing those endorphins. Um, so that's what kind of keeps me motivated to, to keep doing them. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, that's a really good point because there is the body really, well, let me back up. So let's take it back to the beginning. Okay. So if we're saying that we should be able to eat whatever we want because the body has these cravings and we can do whatever we want because we're just honoring the body and it's what my body wants. To unpack that a little bit, let's say someone is having a very unhealthful diet and they're eating a lot of excess sugar. They're eating all those processed carbohydrates. They're eating these highly palatable foods that we know hijack not only our taste buds, but also cause chaos in our brain and give us unnatural cravings um, and sometimes really intense cravings for things that are not healthful for our body. And it's because that's what they're designed to do. They are designed to be addictive. They're designed to make us want to eat these things. And so how can you say you're honoring your body when your body is essentially being held hostage by these unnatural chemicals and substances that we're eating? So I think there's a flaw there. Mm. Um, And the body naturally craves sugar as well. And especially like we know from nutritional therapy that, you know, if you've got um, some kind of dysbiosis or growth or something that's happening in the gut, naturally it feeds on sugar. So it's going to send Mm -hmm. those craving signals to the body to want more sugar. Um, So if you're honoring your body by giving the body what it needs, it's actually, you're not really deciphering between the, what is an actual craving and what the body really needs. I think there, like there's a, there's a lot of noise in all of this. Yes, exactly. And I mean, if we go and if we look at it ancestrally, yes, our body craves sugars because ancestrally that is what our bodies ate to get us through times when we had famine. So when there was sugar around, there were sweet things around, those were there so we could load up on calories for the times when they weren't around. But now we live in modern times where food is abundant. And so our brains still think, yes, I need to eat as much of this sugar as we can because it might not be around. I might not have access to it for a long time, but uh, we have it at our fingertips at any given moment now. So if we were cavemen, 
we could honor <laughs> our body and those cravings, but we're yeah. not cavemen anymore. Yeah. If we were like a blank slate, you know, like I haven't had all these other factors that have come into my life. I haven't had stress and processed foods and my gut dysbiosis and um, all of those things that are, you know, shape the body that I am today, antibiotics, maybe in my past or, you know, all of those things that shape Mm -hmm. the body to what it is, then maybe I could truly tune into my body and listen to what it needs. And if we are listening, the body is going to be saying it's real, fresh, natural foods that's not made from chemicals because the body doesn't know how to process those foods. So, yeah, yeah, if you are there going, okay, I'm going to let my body have what it needs and you're craving... I don't know what are those things you guys eat Twinkie bars or whatever I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who you guys are but that's not me guys <laughs> I mean this standard American diet I know what you mean. yeah <laughs> I don't know what I was going to say here but um if you're eating donuts you know that's not a natural food you know and it's cooked in the highly refined oils which if you can go back to Dr. Kate Shanahan's episode you'll learn a lot about that there um you're not gonna it's that's not really truly listening to what the body needs on the other hand though if you can really tune into the body and listen to what it needs and it is asking for hydration and sleep and all of those types of things then and then I think that can be a really empowering and really good thing and if there is a day when you're like okay, I'm going out for lunch with friends and there's some things on the menu that I know I'm not going to be able to get exactly what I need, but I'm going to eat that and enjoy it and then remove the guilt from that and then move on and come back to what my body really needs. I think that is body positivity to me. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And, um, I think anyone who's done like a whole 30 or has done keto or has followed a low carb diet and has gone from experiencing those intense cravings, um, for sugar, for junk foods or whatever it is, but has gone through one of those lifestyle and dietary switches and learned that our bodies actually are not in a constant state of craving. Like once you break that cycle, within your body, you're not constantly craving, um, those foods. And then it gives you also a point to where you could realize, or to have a time of reflection to really do some, like listening to your body, where if you are craving, having a craving to pause and be able to ask, why am I craving this? And to say, because once you know that it's not addiction or that chemical process in your brain from eating these foods and you're more clear headed, you could assess, am I craving this because of an emotional need I have? Am I, is my body wanting this because maybe I am in a period of stress? Cause we know when we're stressed, we're excreting excess minerals and we're depleting more of our vitamins. So we're craving more foods to replenish those. Um, And even when we're dehydrated, we're going to have more cravings too. And so when you can remove the interference of that, of those, of those foods, then you really can focus on listening to what your body wants. I love that. And it's, you said, it's like when we pause and think, and I think these days we don't spend enough time pausing. We live in a world that's where everything is instant to us all the time. And so we spend a lot of the time living in that world that's just like, well, I need this. I I can get this. I have this. Nothing where we say, well, like, do I, let's stop and think about that for a moment. Let's pause. Actually, do I really need this? Uh, Do I really want this? I think is that's really empowering there. It is. And that you're empowering is the exact word because it goes on it goes beyond just body positivity. It goes, that gets us into the realm of food freedom and empowerment and being able to really take control of our own intuition and that innate wisdom within, within our bodies when we can pause and tune in. Yeah. And, you know, and how do we get to a point 
like that, that's something that I'm really um, digging really deep into at the moment and really loving is creating healthy habits. And, you know, how can I in, like, I've got so much things going through my mind all the time. How can I reduce that noise and focus on maybe just one or two key habits that really are necessary for my health and well-being? So maybe let's just use water again. I'm going to say that I need to increase my water intake because I'm maybe only drinking, especially during winter time, you know, um, I might only be drinking one or two glasses of water a day. So I really want to, you know, up that just a little bit more to my limit. Like, you know, we see lots of different calculations around about how much water we should be drinking. I think there is, you know, again, it's bio-individual to how much you need. Um, we could, we could give some figures around that, but I think that like, it's really worth taking the time to work out how much your body needs because we all do different amounts of activity, different sizes, you know, all those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then focusing on, okay, so I'm going to drink more water. What are the very next steps I need to take to take me from drinking one glass to three glasses of water a day? And how can I shine a spotlight onto that habit so that I can focus and make that habit something part of my everyday life. What steps do I need to take to do that and reduce the noise of the other, other things that I know I need to do, which can be quite overwhelming, not saying they're not important, not discounting them, but I really want to park them maybe for later and come back to them if they're important but this one is my main focus right now to get that habit going and I think that's um, a really important thing to look at because we kind of like once we're you know setting new year's resolutions creating new habits we're all like I've got to do this I've got to do that I've got to do it. like I wrote down my list and there's like 20 things on it and I was like this is ridiculous like I can't do all of these things I can't be all of these things I can't do all of these things which one am I going to focus on first and make sure that habit's embedded into my everyday. And um, it could be a nutrition goal. It could be um, a sleep goal. Like one of my sleep goals is I want to make sure I'm getting seven hours of sleep every night because I start really early in the morning teaching yoga and Pilates. And then um, I finish the evening up later because my husband likes to stay up late. And that's the only time we get to talk to one another. And I've said to him, this year, I've got to focus more on making sure I'm getting that solid seven hours of sleep. So I'm sorry, I'm going to have to start going to bed half an hour later. But how realistically am I going to get to that goal? Yeah, I've got to get to bed earlier. How am I going to get to bed earlier? You know, looking at all of those, I'm shining a spotlight on that habit for net, for this first part of the year. And once I've got that embedded and I'm, I've got that regular sleep happening, I'm in that routine, then I'll move on to my next habit. So that's just a little side bit about, you know, creating habits there and, and, you know, the best kind of way to, you know, and there's different ways of doing it. So you've got to find something that resonates for you. There's multiple different ways to create habits. Mm -hmm. Um, And one book I read every year that I absolutely love is Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's a great book. Uh, And I always, when I go back and revisit it, he's got so many great tips there about creating habits. And it's just a really great read. Have you read that book before, Holly? I have not read that one, but it's on on my wish list. I know (laughs) that's one of my, one of my goals this year is to actually read the books I buy because I have a problem where (laughs) like some women buy shoes, I buy books and I have so many books and like, I'll start them, I'll skim them. I don't really ever actually finish reading all the books. So, well, what's your next achievable step to do that? (laughs) Well, what are you asking me? What is my next step? (laughs) Pick a book and start with a book and not 12 books at once. And just start with one chapter. You know, I'm in a book club and that's what I did. Like I lost my reading mojo for a while and I was like, no, I, I love reading these books. What's going on? I've got to make time for it. So I found some time in my schedule. And even if it's just one chapter, just one chapter, I even... Um, have the audio book and the physical book and sometimes when I'm in the car I'll listen to one chapter I'm always about this one chapter it's one chapter Uh in the car and then when I come back I'm like all right I'm up to chapter two now so I start from chapter two in my book and then I do like a you know bit of both until I got my reading mojo back and then it's like I'm into the book now 
I like that. I do the audio books sometimes too. And actually sometimes that's the only way I can finish a book because then I'll listen in the car. I'll listen as I'm like doing things, but the books I like to read tend to be books that um, I want to take notes in, or I want to like learn. And so that's hard to do in the car. Cause I always feel like I'm listening to the best stuff or having the most aha moments or my most brilliant ideas when I'm in the car and I can't write them down. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. All right. Let's get back on yeah, topic back on here. Track. So yeah. what are, what are some solutions? So we've already talked about how, um, what are some of the things that may not be necessarily right with the body positivity movement. And I think, um, to get back on track and to really just, I know I've said it before, but really just clean out the noise. If you want to have a body positive mindset, then it has to start with foods that are not trying to derail your mindset and foods that are not going to be linked to causing depression or causing anxiety. Um, and, and honestly foods that just aren't making you feel your best. So I think the, the best thing to do for any type of body positivity or body acceptance, no matter what size is to choose foods that, you know, are honoring your body. That's really like the best thing we can do is honor our body with our food choices and give our mind the best opportunity it has to make the best choices and to continue making those best and healthful choices for our bodies. Yeah, exactly. I think that's well said. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be complicated. Like we say this all the time. I think this is such a common theme within our show, no matter what the episode is that health doesn't have to be complicated. Nutrition doesn't have to be complicated. Like it's actually very simple. And when people do make it complicated or you find it getting confusing, that's because someone's trying to sell you something. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. It's like, Oh, I can solve all those problems. You can't figure it out on your own. You can eat real food, yeah. <laughs> drink <right>. water, <laughs> move your body, move your body the and, end. Sleep. and sleep <laughs> <laughs> and sleep, get your rest. Um, but there are other things we can do too. Um, I was thinking about this and I think some uh, things that have really helped me in this of like accepting my body. Cause my body has fluctuated throughout the years and I'm actually not in a place right now. I will, it's, I think for as long as I've been on this podcast, I've talked about how my body has not been where I want it to be. And that's like the journey that I've been on. That's something I'm actively working on, but I've had to come to the point where I'm, I am accepting of it, you know, and maybe it doesn't look exactly how I want it to look right now, but I'm still thankful for it. I'm thankful for it being healthy, despite the fact that it doesn't look the way I really want it to. And it's healthy and I'm able to move. And I kind of had to shift my perspective into making choices, not from a place of, um, disgust or dislike, or even hate. Cause I know some people do hate their bodies, but it's trying to switch those things as like love. And it's like, I know that we have work to do and we can improve together, but let's switch to a place of love. And one of the ways I've been able to do that is by cleaning out my closet and not holding on to those clothes that no longer fit me thinking, Oh, well, well I'm just going to lose this amount of weight. And then I'll be able to fit, fit into that. Or, Oh, these are my skinny jeans. Um, And yes, I I probably will fit into them again, but when I look at them, they make me feel bad about myself or they make me feel like I'm not where I am, or it just highlights how much longer I think the road is or whatever it is. If you have clothes in your closet that don't make you feel good, or if your clothes don't fit you right. And when you get dressed, you throw a fit and say, nothing fits me. And you end up crying in your closet. Not that I know. I've never done that. <laughs> never, never done that. <laughs> then just buy new clothes. It doesn't have to be a bunch. You don't have to go out and get a new wardrobe, but buy clothes that you can feel good putting on now in the shape that your body is in now, even if you don't want it to always be in that shape or size, if you're working through something else, wear something that makes you feel good now. I think that's really important. That's such a great thing to say. Uh, you know, like I spend a lot of my time in active wear and, you know, like 
I, you know, you can see everything in active wear basically. So I do feel at first I was very self-conscious about it, but I buy clothes that fit and look nice and shape to my body rather than trying to fit into something that, you know, society says I should be wearing. Like for me, you know, it's cause it's summer here. Everyone's back into those little, we used to call them bike shorts in the eighties or whatever. Like everyone's wearing those <laughs> yes. short shorts. I'm like, <laughs> my legs just don't suit the short shorts. I've got short legs, you know, like (laughs) short shorts and, and me don't work. Um, So I'm not going to wear them just because they're in fashion. I'm not going to, you know, persevere with something like that doesn't make me feel good when I wear them. Um, I'm going to pull out my nice bright patterns and put them on and make myself feel good about what I'm wearing rather than stand there thinking, Oh gosh, everybody's looking at me while I'm teaching them Pilates or whatever, but you know, they're not, they're just all concentrating on themselves. So (laughs) that's another great piece of advice. No one's looking at you. They're all looking at themselves. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I think that's, you know, that's a really good thing. Yeah. Buy clothes that you feel comfortable in and that you, you like to wear, Um, you know, summer here, we've been going to the water park a fair bit. I hate walking around in my swimmers. Um, so I've just bought a pair that has like little kind of skirt thing that comes off them and it looks really cute. And I walk around like, ah, oh, these are cute, <laughs> you know, so feel, feel good in the clothes that you're wearing, feel good about yourself. That's one thing I do like about the body positivity movement. If you want to wear the short shorts, just wear them. Like if that makes you feel good and you're happy when you wear them, just wear them. That's, that's body posi- positivity there. Yes. I love it. So that was my one thing. And my other thing that I suggest doing is purging, like to go through and do a purge of your social media. If there are, if there are things, accounts, people, whatever showing up in your feed that does not make you feel good about yourself. If you find yourself looking at someone and thinking of all the things you're not, or wishing you had what they had or look the way they look or want to do something. I know people follow accounts of what they want, thinking that it's going to motivate them or inspire them. But I know that that often flips and turns ugly and ends up turning into a pity party and making you have this woe is me. I'm not there. It doesn't matter whatever the circumstances are. If they're accounts that you're following that make you feel less than great, um, that don't inspire you, that don't make you happy or bring you joy you know the Marie Kwand Marie Kondo <laughs> if your Instagram feed does not bring you joy then you can change it curate it stop following the accounts that don't make you feel good and those are my two tips of advice no I love those and just to add to that I'd probably say and follow ones that do make you feel good if you would if you do want to um you know, keep on with those. So keep on with your social media. Uh, and someone, one of someone we've had on the podcast a couple of times who I really love is Stephanie Dodier. And she talks a lot about coming um, at the, at yourself with a place of neutrality. Um, and I really love that too. So if you can't get to that point where I love myself and everything that I'm doing um, and, or you're still in that loathing and, you know, hate or whatever kind of words you're using, maybe approach it from that neutrality point of view. And she has a lot of resources and information on that. So she's definitely my go-to for anything like this. I'm always over there looking at her. What would Stephanie say about this? Ah, love it. She's always got it. Yeah. (laughs) I do love Stephanie. I don't know if Stephanie would say this, but this will be my, this will be my Hollyism for the day. No matter how you're feeling about body positivity or body neutrality or whatever you're feeling about the body. I just have to say that if you're eating junk food, watching junk TV, feeding your mind junk, you're going to have junk thoughts, junk emotions, and junk feelings. So start there. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's a great place to end. Holly, you didn't have anything else to say there? (laughs) (laughs) No, that's it. That's my, that's my wrap up. Yeah, I enjoyed that. And I there was a little line at the end of the article too, which kind of says that um, a better solution is to take the middle ground to love your body at whatever weight, but at the same time work towards being healthier. So that's the same kind of message that we've been coming across with this episode. Yes. Yeah, that was a good, that was a good little wrap up that they put there on the article. Yeah. And uh, so that's all we have for today. Next week, we have Aaron Day on the podcast. 
uh, he's going to be talking about uh, how to bring carbs back in if you've um, been on keto for quite a while. So I thought that was quite an interesting chat we're going to have with him. So look out for that one. Um, and that's the end of today's episode. So our theme music is created by Andrew Bowden and production services are by Kevin Kennedy Spain of Disc of Light Media. Have a great week, everyone. Have a great week. <laughs>